Hey friends, I recently made a blog post in which I complained about the intellectually vapid rationalizations of the pro-evolutionary psychology crowd. And then I got entangled with a couple of libertarian fetishizing dudes who have fully drunk the Kool-Aid of EP. And while I've written about the problems of evolutionary psychology multiple times, apparently I've got to say it again on a different medium. So here we go. Why do I despise EP? Other than the fact that it's risably absurd, always seems to attract misogynistic pseudo-scientific race realists and other fantasists, and its proponents all seem to be ignorant about evolutionary theory. Well, the fact that it is wrong is kind of critical. And to know why it's wrong, I'll have to explain some evolutionary basics. Douglas Futuma is one of those household names among evolutionary biologists. He's written some popular textbooks on that subject, so these definitions can be regarded as relatively orthodox and canonical. The key thing in that first definition is that evolution is multi-generational change. He should have also mentioned heritable in a population without regard to the mechanism that causes that change. This is going to be a problem for evolutionary psychology because they only recognize one significant mechanism, adaptation. The second quote up there is a definition of adaptation, which is going to be another problem for evolutionary psychology. An adaptation is a characteristic that enhances the survival or reproduction of organisms that bear it relative to alternative character states especially in the ancestral condition in the population in which the adaptation evolved. Keep that definition in mind. I will return to it. You don't have to memorize it. I'll, I'll put it up again. But it's kind of central to the argument here. For now, this is the important bit. There are multiple mechanisms that drive evolution. Selection is only part of evolution, a very important part, and selection tends to be conservative for us. It can eliminate variation. If Fatuma is not enough for you, Michael Lynch will tell you the same thing, that evolution is a population genetic process governed by four fundamental processes. Darwin articulated one of those forces, the process of natural selection, for which an elaborate theory in terms of genotype frequencies now exists. The remaining three evolutionary forces are non-adaptive in the sense that they are not a function of the fitness property of individuals. Mutation is the ultimate source of variation on which natural selection acts. Recombination assorts variation within and among chromosomes. And genetic drift ensures that gene frequencies will deviate a bit from the generation to generation independent of other forces. So got it? There's, if there's any one thing you learn in an evolutionary biology course, it's that there are multiple forces involved. And sometimes one of the hardest things to determine is whether a feature is the product of selection or drift, for instance. Another important idea is fixation. That is, the situation where an allele or trait is ubiquitous or every individual expresses it. The naive expectation is that if every individual has a particular trait, it must have been selected for. But this is not true. Ubiquity is not evidence of positive selection because other processes can produce it. As we'll see later, evolutionary psychology uses another criterion, functionality, that also isn't evidence of selection. So how can an allele become fixed in a population? Selection can drive the frequency to 100%. Nothing in anything I'm saying is dismissing the importance of selection. Founder effect is another process, a shift in allele frequency when a new population is founded by colonization from a larger population. Genetic draft or hitchhiking. Uh, the allele can be physically located near a different, positively selected allele. So, so it's just taking a ride on the um, positive selective values for another trait. And genetic drift, the change in frequency caused by random sampling. So sampling error plays a significant role in evolution, especially in smaller populations. Okay, so I said that one common argument that evolutionary psychology uses is that it's functional, therefore it's selected. I'll get to that in a minute, but first we have to do some simple math. So here's another thing about selection. It doesn't come for free. 
The thing about selection as a mechanism is that it imposes a cost on the population. Individuals that are less capable of survival or reproduction have to be paired away, which means every nudge upwards in frequency of an allele requires the sacrifice of individual lives or fertility, relatively speaking. So selection imposes a genetic load, and we can calculate it from the mutation rate and the number of genes in a genome. This is an old formula. It's been around for a long time. This is one of the formula used to estimate the total number of genes in the human genome, for instance. All you need to know for now is that blithely suggesting that a trait was selected for implies that a price was paid for it in lives cost or frustrated fertility or truncated healthy lives or dead babies. It can be a heavy cost or it can be a light cost, but they all add up. And simply postulating that every single detail and feature of human bi biology was selected implies an immense price. There are limits to how much selection a population can bear before it collapses under the weight of all the failures and the rarity of successes. Fortunately, most of the variation in a population is not produced by selection. This is part of Tomoko Oda's nearly neutral theory. What she determined is that there's a threshold level of fitness that the selection coefficient has to rise above before the power of selection can kick in and drive an allele to fixation. Natural selection is a powerful force, but there are limitations. I like to compare it to compound interest. Even a low interest rate can generate a fortune. So why isn't everyone rich? Because there are also fixed and random expenses that can prevent one from being able to invest. Even if interest rates are identical for everyone, if your income is at a low level, it can be totally disrupted by the expenses of, say, a fender bender or a hospital stay. You'll never be able to take advantage of that power of compound interest. So, selection works best in large populations that aren't seriously impacted by the vagaries of chance events like mutation. Small populations, or ones that are prone to more random variation, are going to be more susceptible to those random variations. They could win the lottery, or they could get hit by a bus. Events that are less damaging to large, rich species with lots of buffer capacity. So let's summarize some of these basic facts that every evolutionary biologist should take for granted. There are multiple forces at work, not just selection. These are valid, legitimate, alternative explanations for why a particular trait exists. There are limits to selection. Remember, selection works by making a trait advantageous and promoting individuals with that trait at the expense of individuals who lack it. But at the same time, populations are diverse, remain diverse, and can become more diverse over time. Selection may minimize that by calling out deviance, but at the same time, you have to admit, if you look around at your friends and family, we aren't a clone army. How can all these differences thrive if selection has a cost? One answer is that most of the observed variation is neutral or nearly neutral. Selection isn't harming most mundane variation, so the fact that we have different nose shapes or ear shapes or food preferences or have different talents isn't costing our population anything. It may matter to you, but it's meaningless noise to the force of selection. So these small variations are invisible to selection. This does not imply that no variants can be selected upon. But we have to take some care in measuring an observed phenomenon and its significance to the population. Any theory about how a particular feature of an organism evolved has to keep all these factors in mind. You can't just wave your hands and say, selection did it. If there's any one slide here that I'm showing you that is important, it's this one. These are the things that you need to know to understand the problems with evolutionary psychology. And it's so important that I'll say right now, if you want to stop right now, you've got the most important points. And I'll include a copy of these points in, in the section down below so that you can just read them. Really, this is the important stuff. This is what I've, I wish everybody who talks about evolution would understand. And what happens if you don't understand these principles? You get evolutionary psychology. This particular summary from the founders of the discipline isn't particularly radical. I'd agree with it. 
So it says, evolutionary psychology is simply psychology is informed by the additional knowledge that evolutionary biology has to offer in the expectation that understanding the process that designed the human mind will advance the discovery of its architecture. Great. I'm all for that. I agree totally with this. Of course the brain evolved. Of course the mind is a product of the brain. Or of course the same forces that shaped the evolution of our bodies shaped our minds. Unfortunately, evolutionary psychologists have a peculiar and limited understanding of evolution that isn't at all like that of evolutionary biologists. So it'd be nice if they'd goddamn quit falsely trading on the good name of evolutionary biology. This statement is a platitude. It's trivially true, and no evolutionary biologist would disagree with it. But it's part of a strategy they use. If you disagree with the details of their, their claims, they'll bounce back and say, Aha! So you don't think the brain evolved. You disagree with this trivial statement, which is not true. So here's the big flaw in evolutionary psychology. This is a definition from someone outside the field. So they're saying evolutionary psychology is a narrowly circumscribed adaptationist research program which regards the human mind as an integrated collection of cognitive mechanisms that guide our behavior and form our universal human nature. These cognitive mechanisms are supposed to be adaptations, the result of evolution by natural selection, that is, heritable variation in fitness. Adaptations are traits present today because in the past they helped our ancestors to solve recurrent adaptive problems. Ah, adaptation, adaptation, adaptation. That point about narrowly circumscribed is important. Evolutionary psychologists assume that everything by default is an adaptation, or if it's not, it's not important. They will squeak and protest at that characterization, but all you have to do is glance at the Evolutionary Psychology Frequently Asked Questions document, which is maintained at the University of California, Santa Barbara, where many of the leading lights of evolutionary psychology are employed, to see that it's rife with adaptationist thinking. I mention it here, and I will include a link down below, because it is a central source document for much of the dogma of evolutionary psychology. And it's revealing because evolutionary psychologists look at it and fail to see anything wrong with its main premises. It's a long-winded, tedious mountain of garbage assertions, and yet its proponents look at it with pride and confidence. Like I say, it's a long-winded bore of a document. The author doesn't believe in clarity or brevity, it's obvious. But one thing you can do is search for the word adapt, as I did, and it will light up like a Christmas tree. There are very few lines in this document that don't include the word adaptation. I've tried this same trick on evolutionary biology papers, and the word adapt or adaptation is only used sparsely and cautiously because we have some standards, you know. It takes a lot of work to establish that something is an adaptation. But this distant view isn't really fair. Let's look closely enough to be able to read the thing. So here he's saying that evolutionary psychology focuses on the evolved properties of nervous systems, especially those of humans, because virtually all tissue in living organisms is functionally organized. Functionally organized, okay. And because this organization is a product of evolution by natural selection, there's a huge assumption right there. A major presumption of evolutionary psychology is that the brain too is functionally organized and best understood in evolutionary perspective. It is clear the body is composed of a very large number of parts and that each part is highly specialized to perform a specific function. That's debatable. In service of the survival and reproduction of the organism. Using the body as a model for the brain, it is a fair guess that the brain, too, is composed of one or more functional parts, each of which is also specialized to facilitate the survival and reproduction of the organism. Okay, note the neat trick being pulled here. Functionality is treated as a synonym for natural selection. He's also claiming that each part is highly specialized to a specific function. In many ways, this is indistinguishable from anything the Discovery Institute might write, except that they've swapped intelligent designer with natural selection. And they do it with about as much concern about positive evidence for their hypothesis 
And they've also tossed in a bunch of other words used loosely to fit their ends. How do you determine functional? That's kind of a critical word here. What is a part? What are they talking about when they talk about a part of the brain? So, for example, let's think of a counterexample here. Noses. Noses are definitely functional. In fact, one concern might be that they have many functions. Respiration, filtration, olfaction, sexual attraction. Well, because everything is sexual. And they also exhibit a lot of variation. This particular picture is of all white people's noses. But even within that narrow subset, we see differences. Is every difference the product of selection? Maybe. I guess you could hypothesize that. Although it's peculiar that all of them seem equally functional. One isn't less functional than the other. It's going to take a lot of work to figure out how these variations have differential fitness if they do. Which is the optimal nose? Could it be all of them? You know, how about if we reserve the term adaptive for features where we actually have evidence of the variations affecting survival or reproduction? Because remember, a majority of variations are going to be neutral or invisible to selection. Evolutionary psychologists, though, think everything is a target for selection. We see this in the Evolutionary Psychology Frequently Asked Questions document. Here's the part where they try to define adaptation. Only not really. Everything that functions is treated as an adaptation. So they say evolutionary biologists refer to the functional components of organisms as adaptations. So I'll show you in a moment that's not true. Evolutionary psychologists often refer to brain functions as psychological adaptations, although they are not qualitatively different from other adaptations. Okay, what do evolutionary biologists actually say about adaptation? I've already shown you this. This is Fatuma's definition of uh, adaptation. So, you know, this is, this is what we actually think. An adaptation is a characteristic that enhances the survival or reproduction of organisms that bear it relative to alternative character states. So, yeah, you can't just say this is an adaptation. You actually have to show that it has affected in some way the survival or reproduction of the individual that bears it. That's something we skip altogether. We simply say, well, hey, noses, they're functional. Nobody's going to argue with that noses are not functional. But that's not the question. The question is, are the alternative states of noses equally functional? <sighs> so, that's a problem. They're, they're pretty loose with their definitions. So I was once confronted online by an evolutionary psychologist who gave me a quiz. Oh yeah, this is, this is going to be fun. Here it is. I'll give you a moment to come up with an answer, given what I've told you so far. Okay, let's, let's go skip ahead to the answers. Did you figure out what the problem is? There are a couple. Anyway, I think we all agree with point two. Yes, the brain is an organ. Great. Probably three, two is okay. Well, it's a little bit more aspirational. Yeah, the brain is a product of its history. We'd like to tease apart all the forces that acted over time to produce these big brains of ours, but we don't know them all. It's number one that's a problem. The brain is a mostly functional organ, sure. And overall, selection has been an important force. I would agree entirely that the reason we have these large brains is a product of selection. But is everything about the brain functional and adaptive? That's where we disagree. You can't simply assume that a feature present in the brain is adaptive. So, you know, a lot of evolutionary psychology focuses on the minutiae of human behavior, often within the narrow bounds of Western middle-class culture, and it tries to force adaptive explanations on trivial phenomena. It's not just a joke. It's appalling how much evolutionary psychology is churned out by marketing departments at business schools. So, why do women shop for shoes? Because capitalist business schools want them to buy shoes. 
and they advertise for it and they promote these kind of cultural preconceptions. Uh, but evolutionary psychologists want to argue that it's some kind of instinct, it's genetic, and they never get around to demonstrating that. The late Don Rosen had more than a few criticisms of the field, and here he is proposing that a hypothetical evolutionary psychology would be a useful paradigm if three conditions were true. And here are those three conditions. One is all the traits were adaptations. We know that one is false already. It would be true if it was easy to characterize the traits. Some traits are. I mean, we can identify enzyme polymorphisms, for instance. We can measure their, their activity in a test tube as well as in a person. But the domain of psychology contains some of the most slippery, complex phenomena we know. Witness the decades of debate about, for instance, IQ, or current debates about gender. Those are not easy to characterize. And thirdly, he suggests that if plausible ex adaptive explanations were difficult to come by, that would be persuasive. Oh, why is he saying that? Why difficult as a criterion? Because uh, one of the goals we have here is to come up with a narrow set of explanations. If you can come up rapid fire with thousands of explanations, that's not very convincing that any one of them is correct. Now, this is what Stephen Jay Gould complained about. It's easy to generate just so stories about evolutionary events. So easy that sometimes they're invented, and then the author can simply sit back, don't do no work, and accept the plaudits for coming up with something that sure looks superficially possible. See the aquatic ape hypothesis, for example. But, as Rosen says, looking at how the brain evolved is a great idea. We ought to support that kind of research. Unfortunately, evolutionary psychologists are not doing it. Now, I could stop here. The foundational premises of evolutionary psychology are wrong. Therefore, the field should be dismissed out of hand. However, I also have to point out that this is bad science that is also used to support bad and sadly popular conclusions. This is not to say the truth of a science should be judged by whether it avoids troubling conclusions, but that the popularity of evolutionary psychology seems to be driven by how much it props up conventional bigotry. So here we go. To steal a phrase from Kevin Logan, it's the inevitable bit about rape. This is not to say that evolutionary psychology must rationalize rape, but it's peculiar how often it is used for just that purpose, to the point that the evolutionary psychology frequently asked questions document has to include a section addressing it. That fact is such an unintentional source of damning evidence against evolutionary psychology, you'd almost think a devious critic wrote it to undermine EP. Here, the author explains that rape hasn't been demonstrated to be an adaptation, Good for him. But it's conceivable, he says. So he brings up the existence of coercive insemination in other animals as if it's relevant, without mentioning this usually occurs in non-social animals where the males are not involved in infant care, that is, not in humans. But then the worst part is the bit where he lists the benefits of rape for males. It is a terrible list. Rape is a great thing for high-status males and low-status males. Low-status women could be raped without cost. And in war, it was open season on raping women. Remember, to an evolutionary psychologist, reproduction and survival are the be-all and end-all of behavior, but apparently male reproduction and survival are all that matters. He fails to mention any benefit of rape to females, you know. Half the population, the part that bears a disproportionate cost of child-rearing, there is no awareness that the welfare of females might be a significant factor in determining whether rape is an adaptation. It's a kind of blindness that's endemic in the field, and one of the reasons evolutionary psychology has such an unsavory reputation. But it's not just women who are ignored, and men who are the sole object of interest. It's all about the white men. You can't dig very deeply into evolutionary psychology before you find all the justifications for eugenics, 
the superiority of certain races or the correlation of races with specific behavioral traits. Trust me, it gets ugly fast. So when we argue that one thing is an adaptation, such as the physiological adaptations of Tibetans, Indians, and Ethiopians to life at high altitudes, sure, why not pretend that the stereotypes of Jews are similarly real and adaptive? Or that the claim that black people are naturally and genetically predisposed to violence is valid? A just-so story is enough justification for that, right? And then we might as well mingle sexism and racism and invent a boogeyman, cultural Marxism, as an umbrella term for anyone who opposes your cartoon version of evolution. It's a weird ideology that simultaneously treats white women as an ethereal symbol of biological perfection, yet also argues that raping them is an evolutionarily defensible strategy. Cultural Marxism, by the way, is just a euphemism for the Jews. Like I said before, this is the argument deployed by so many evolutionary psychologists. If you dispute their fallacious interpretations built on foundational errors in their premises, why, you must reject all of evolution and are therefore a creationist. If you disagree with Charles Darwin, a Victorian scholar, in any way, you must be in a war against Darwinism. The quote they give from Darwin is accurate, by the way, and it's from one of the most gratingly racist chapters of his book, The Descent of Man. But it doesn't go far enough. In that same paragraph, he also contrasts the taciturn, even morose aborigines of South America and the light-hearted, talkative Negroes. Darwin took for granted many of the racist stereotypes of his time, which is a good reason to read his writings critically and not take everything as gospel. But of course, they're not going to mention the caricatures of race that are presented in that chapter because that becomes a little too obvious that maybe Charles Darwin wasn't the true prophet that everyone wants him to be thought of as. Modern evolutionary biologists are not required to adopt the bigotry of this racial pseudoscience of the 18th and 19th century, even if modern evolutionary psychologists seem a little too willing to do so. By the way, there is a scientific discipline that studies the biological and cultural underpinnings of human behavior. Maybe you should look into it.